and uh, uh, these practical application are for uh, managers leaders facilitators scrum masters and uh, agile coaches and the whole team really Uh, about myself, uh, uh, Simon, you already introduced me. I can only add that I've been an agile practitioner uh, on and off between 2001-2003, and then I've always been into agile since then. I've been a complexity practitioner since 2004, and I will go back to that, and uh, a lean practitioner since 2006. Well, um, this meetup is about uh, uh, Agile and all things uh, Agile and Lean. The three legs of modern way of working are really uh, Agile, Lean and complexity. And complexity is one of those three legs. Why 2004? Because in 2004, uh, Joseph Perling started to introduce the idea of complexity to the Agile community in order to explain why uh, agile works and since then I continued my journey into complexity reading a lot of different authors uh, reading a lot of different models some hard to find and I try and I try to collect those models and most of all uh, practical applications that can be used in the context of software and digital products development practical application that are, are quite hard to find because a lot of people, a lot of books talk about the theory, but then when we want to put that theory in practice, uh, it become a little more difficult. And when I realized that I had collected enough practical uh, application, enough practices to build up a, a catalog, uh, I had this idea to publish this catalog. And this is where the idea of this book come from. Uh, this book and this catalog of practices is based on the work of Joseph Perling that I just mentioned, especially in relation to uh, self-organization. Dave Snowden, uh, that we know uh, very well for his work around Kinevin. Uh, David Al Alberts, uh, that made uh, an extremely interesting work around C2 approach space, and the Ralph Stacy. Uh, among uh, the practices that I collected, there are also uh, two contributors that contributed with their own original practices. Uh, you may know them because they are part of the Agile community, so Dean Lachana and Liz Kaug. And then I receive a lot of uh, feedback from uh, co-workers, uh, fellow members of the Agile community, and you can read uh, all the names there. Uh, you may find someone that uh, you know, uh, Carlo Beschi is here, David Ledge. Uh, also later on, uh, uh, Carlo Volpi contributed with a super interesting map. So thank you, everyone. Today, and uh, together with the idea of practical application of complexity theory, uh, I would like to introduce to, if you want, radical ideas or radical approach around complexity. The first one, as I mentioned, is the idea to turn upside down the center of gravity of the conversation around complexity. Let's for a moment stop to talk about the theory and try to look at things uh, uh, mainly from the, the practice point of view. Most of the people that uh, uh, learn new ideas, they usually prefer to start with practical examples or with actual hands-on practice. So if you're one of those people, uh, looking at the catalog of practical application may be the way for you to get an introduction into uh, complexity theory. But instead, if uh, you know already complexity theory, those practices may be the best way to introduce the concept of complexity to your team members, to the whole team, and also uh, to the rest of the organization. Yes, there are many, many uh, people passionate about uh, complexity. And it's 15 years that you are talking about complexity in the Agile community. But then when we look at at everyday work in the team, 
uh, we do not see many practices inspired by complexity. So I would like to change these. And uh, so let me start to talk immediately about one practice, one practical application of complexity. Uh, I call it basic model and is inspired by Joseph Perlin and uh, is based on self-organization. Is a practice that help us to deal with self-organization. So what is human self-organization? In a nutshell, is a social process. It is a social process that is spontaneous and ongoing because we are social, we are social beings. And uh, it happens between people in the organization, employees, consultants, customers, suppliers, everyone talking and relating to each other. And uh, these local interaction are like a conversation that we are having with our teammate, uh, uh, debating uh, uh, a possible solution, talking about the problem, discussing an idea. And while we do this, we constantly negotiate who we want to be at work, the meaning that we give to what happened around us and what we want to do together. All these local interactions generate a population-wide pattern. Things that when we raise our heads up and we look around the organization, we see some pattern of behaviors or action emerge. For example, culture is something like that. Another example of a population-wide pattern is a tension that may be building up during a company merger. And those patterns are the result of those local interactions. So, Other example of complex system may be a weather system or a, a, a forest, for example. I may go out with the mountain bike in a summer morning and uh, take a ride across the forest. Maybe even stop in the middle, sit there and enjoy the warm weather and uh, the silence around. But then the next day, just the next day, there could be in the same forest wildfires. So a forest that is an example of a self-organizing system can go either way, can be beautiful one day and terrible the next. And that's why an organization or a team may want to try to orient self-organization toward outcomes that are desirable and beneficial. Now, let me just add one thing. We are talking about self-organization from complexity science. But you, for sure, have heard before uh, self-organization from Agile Software Development Manifesto in one of the principles, number 11. Well, those two uh, terms have a slightly different meaning. So one of the work that I've done in this catalog is also to highlight uh, potential misunderstanding or different use of the terminology. For, for us, it's uh, super interesting to know that self-organization as intended in software development require as a prerequisite self-organization as intended by complexity science. So the way that I just uh, described self-organization from a complexity science point of view, all the theory connected to that and also all the practical application apply also to software, uh, agile software development because it's kind of a prerequisite. Going back to our practice, Joseph Perlin start immediately uh, telling, look, when you are forming a new team or when you are bootstrapping a new team, you should check the prerequisite for self-organization uh, to make sure that uh, the prerequisites are in place. Otherwise, there cannot be any self-organization. The first one is critical mass. You need at least three people so that the, those local interaction can actually create those uh, uh, population-wide patterns. The second is diversity with inclusion and dissent. So here is a surprise. It's not just about harmony and collaboration. It is perfectly okay to disagree. And actually we need that disagreement because without that, the whole team or the whole organization may align uh, into group thinking and there is no self-organization there. Or 
there can be blind spot that uh, can be extremely detrimental. And then you need an environment as a prerequisite for uh, self-organization, uh, virtual or physical. The time uh, also is part of that environment. And that environment should be big enough so that people have room for maneuver, room to interact, room to change, room to adapt. But that environment should also be small enough so that people cannot avoid each other. I don't know if you have ever seen one of those teams where they may come together, for example, at the stand-up, but they have no interest in listening what each other is going to say. Because for the rest of the day, every team member will work on its, his or her own task alone. Maybe someday later, he or she will hand over that task to someone else. But for most of the day, people is just working alone. They are avoiding each other. No, the environment needs to be small enough so people need to interact. And finally, letting people do it. What it means? Allowing those social interaction, allowing those negotiation of meaning and, and decisions, allowing to enact those decisions, not just from a social point of view of the coffee machine or gossip, but also for what relates the work itself. So those are the prerequisite. And if these prerequisites are not in place, it means that the organization are hindering or frustrating that spontaneous process of self-organization. Instead, if, if an organization allow or even supported that the spontaneous process, that organization still have the possibility to exploit the potential of self-organization. Then Joseph Perlin say, okay, if you want to try to orient that spontaneous process in order to achieve something that is good for you, there, here is something that you can do. Here are a few control knobs or dials that you can use and tweak trying to influence the population-wide patterns that emerge and so the dynamic of the team. One of those uh, control knobs is team size. Just changing the size of the team, you can make a team more receptive to new ideas. If the team size is smaller, the team is more likely to reach out for suggestion and new idea. And on top of that, if the team is smaller, it can reach consensus more quickly about trying something new. Boundaries is the second control knobs. Boundaries is about the boundaries who, who is inside the team and who is outside and deciding who is inside and outside or changing that uh, also have a huge influence, can have a huge influence on the team dynamic. People inside the team have very frequent interaction and those interactions are quite intense and deep. But instead the people from inside the team and uh, people from the outside, those interactions are less frequent and less intense. And then roles. Roles has the power to activate different identities, like uh, being a father or being a team member or being a, a football player. Different roles activate different identities. And so changing the roles uh, uh, activate different identities that lead to potential different by behaviors. Let me make a practical example. Scrum. Uh, uh, break down the project manager role and replace it with two different roles, scrum masters and product owners. And do that in order to try to create different behaviors and different way of acting. One tip, one suggestion on using these control knobs. Don't try to tweak too many control knobs one after the other, like a mad scientist. I like this metaphor that comes from uh, Carlo Beschi. No, you cannot do that, especially if you are a leader external from the team. 
team members and the system have memory disposition and propensity so after you do an experiment you alter the system imagine if you uh, piss off someone or have a bad interaction with someone that person will remember that it's not something that you can uh, reverse quickly so in order to avoid the problem uh, the best things to do is to start observing the forces at work in the system in the self-organizing system start to develop situational awareness so take it easy first look around and try to understand what once you understand that the system is a complex system and there is some organ self-organization going on second when you start to think about which experiment which control knobs you want to tweak and why involve immediately the person that will be affected if they are involved it's more likely that those change in uh, disposition and propensity uh, will not be negative so involve them in the whole process in selecting the experiment in enacting the experiment and in evaluating uh, the outcome the approach of using these control knobs and this is something important uh, uh, from joseph perlin uh, is uh, trial and error so you cannot uh, design an intervention on the control knobs up front uh, based on the desired outcome because this this system is not deterministic there is no clear cause and effect the only thing that you know is that uh, changing those control knobs may change the team's dynamic and then you have to observe if the change is positive you can keep the change maintain the change that you have done or even try to amplify in order to get more of that a good change if the result is negative you will reverse back the latest change so i don't know if you noticed uh, uh, about uh, this description of uh, this uh, uh, practice uh, practical application that i've done i just uh, gave you some uh, introduction so the basic concept that you need to know in order to understand the practice in this case uh, it was something about self-organization then i described the purpose we want to try to orient self-organization toward beneficial and positive outcomes I told you that self-organization is related to complexity theory. And then I, I gave a description how it works. And doing that, I also have some uh, practical tips and stories. So this is a format that is a good format to describe a practical application of a complexity theory. If you are familiar with the software design pattern, there is a way to document a software design pattern. There is a model. And this is a good model that instead is good for complexity practices. Now, I mentioned two uh, quite new radical ideas. The second new radical ideas is that we are people. We are not algorithm and hives many literature out there is about uh, uh, mathematical or algorithmic simulation cellular automata boys or other literature is about biological models uh, or uh, animals flocks swarms and so on but we are human beings we are people and this is something human complex system have some characteristic that is extremely specific so you cannot automatically take the theory and the learning from uh, other complex system and use it for human beings let me describe these characteristics the agents in a complex system in a human complex system are heterogeneous we are all different we are not the same we are not uh, in a box uh, replaceable as a component the second element is intentionality we have free will spontaneity and agency we are not moved by some mathematical rules we are not just driven by instinct and desire or by pain and pleasure but instead we are moved by something more for one could be belief 
for one could be values, what you care, or even irrationality and emotions. And then we have intelligence. Yes, we have memory. Yes, we can learn. But what is specific about human is that we can co-create new knowledge and share that no, new knowledge. So the second crazy idea is that we should focus on human complexity. There are two branches of complexity that focus on human beings, and it's social complexity and anthro complexity. More generally, I use the term, the term human complexity to describe both of them. So human complexity, the human element, have a huge, a huge impact on the practices that we adopt. For example, even in self-organization, uh, there are many practices in self-organization that overall describe 20, about 20 control knobs. But uh, uh, this idea of the human element have a huge impact on those practices, on the way that we use those control knobs. For example, leaders and the managers need to know that uh, even the CEO does not have a privileged vantage point, an objective point of view, and a complete view of the old system. No one can have that. But each one of us is like a human sensor. Every one of us is taking a picture for a specific point of view. And if we bring together all those pictures, still our view of the old system will be incomplete. Still our knowledge of the system will be incomplete but it will be much more rich and complete than before. So it means that leaders, managers, senior leaders need to involve people, human sensor from the whole organization, especially everyone that is involved and affected by the topic that they are discussing, for example, strategy to mention one, they should involve that people to get their better understanding and visibility. Practices that recognize the human element also enable our creativity, uh, our, our initiative, they free the potential of our intelligence and enable us to act and react properly. And those are things that we want uh, in a modern organization that do knowledge work. Another misunderstanding that comes from uh, ignoring the human element is that people sometimes try to bring uh, conclusions that come from uh, from non-human uh, complex model into complex model. The most uh, uh, famous one of this misapplication is the idea that you can program human being using a small number of simple rules, like it happened in the Boyd simulation, where birds like objects with a few simple rules behave like a flock. Well, that logic does not work in human system because of the characteristic that I mentioned before. So all these practices uh, that are described here and are mainly around self-organization, uh, you see the basic model, the heat model, the flow model, abide model, and the other two, all those practices are based on uh, what I just described you on the, you are influenced by uh, those ideas around the human element that I just described. And then there are these practices uh, that are around the complex system and the, the work that we do that are also uh, uh, influenced by the human's uh, element. For example, sensing complexity practice, a practice that serves, that uh, is useful to assess the degree of complexity of the work that we do, uses consensus and agreement as two elements of our human experience in order to get an assessment of the estimation. Estimating complexity by Litz Kelga, that I'm going to talk to you very quickly, instead uses uh, the human element, the question, who have done this before in order to assess the degree of complexity of a practice? And who is a person, a human being? 
Complexity estimation is a practice that I developed myself. Look at the, the degree of complexity from a technical point of view, from the domain point of view, and from the team dynamic point of view. But the assessment is made by people, by do, those that are doing the work. And then just to mention another example, the four point method from Dave Snowden, bring together all the elements that I have just mentioned, technology, domain, people, uh, the inherent nature of the, of the problem, inherent complexity of the problem. They bring all these elements together and the way that these elements interact together in order to estimate the degree of complexity from a human point of view. And then finally, just to reiterate again how much the human element influenced the practical application. All these three applications read the team uh, from Dean Lachana, counter affinity assessment that I developed myself and in incubation that originate from ThoughtWorks. Those are based on co-creation that is a dynamic of people in a complex system. So the human element have a is fundamental in practical applications. I mentioned before practices inspired uh, around the self-organization. These practices, there are a, a set of practices that instead uh, are around the work that we do. And uh, like uh, the practice that I mentioned before from Leeds, they are about estimating the uh, degree of complexity of the work that we do. And so when you know the degree of complexity, you can adapt your way of working and your approach based on the actual degree of complexity. To make an example, sometimes you hear people say there are type of work that uh, fit perfectly waterfall. There is other type of work that fit perfectly scrum and extreme programming. Then there is and agile in general. There are highly innovative type of work that is instead at the age of cows where maybe you have a lean UX and other more experimental approaches. So this is the idea that different way of working, uh, different degree of complexity lead to different way of working. And all these practices provide you a lot of different things like team settings, decision making approach, changes to the um, information sharing and so on. Lot of elements that you can change based on the degree of complexity of the work. But first you have to assess the degree of complexity. And given that people that usually work with the simple stuff think, see everything as simple. People that work with complex stuff see everything as complex. Having some practices that enable you to do an actual estimation is extremely important and enable you to go beyond your uh, personal biases, cognitive biases. So inside the organization, there can be many systems that are potentially complex. And since those systems are potentially complex, they may become the source of a complex dynamics. One system is the network of social relationship between people that I was mentioning before, uh, employees, partners, suppliers, and so on, or users and customers, tech savvy, hyper-connected, constantly interacting. That's also a potentially complex system. And another potentially complex system is the technological component, the code base, uh, uh, software modules, services, infrastructure, and so on. And then we have the work to do that come in this complex system. Work to do in the form of requirements, they can be ambiguous, fragmented, there can be a competing priority, shifting goals, or the technology where, for example, you may have, a, a, in order to implement the solution, you may need a huge number of systems, you have accidental dependencies, maybe fragile integration, maybe massive legacy code base, and all these things can become source of complexity. And then you have the dynamic of the team, of the people, that are unpredictable and uncontrollable. 
And also that can become a source of complexity. Basically, we have on the right, we have two systems, people and technology that are potentially complex. And then we have the work to do that can generate, meeting those systems can generate a complex dynamic. That's how uh, we can have different degree of complexity. The practice uh, uh, described by, by Liz Kelg uh, approach the idea of assessing the degree of complexity based on the world, based on the question who have done this before uh, in the world. And she suggests a scale that goes from five, nobody have done this before ever, to one, we all know how to do it. Uh, Liz suggested to uh, use this case to make an estimation of uh, the work that we have to do, the capability that we have to build, or the user stories and the epics that we have in our backlog. And she suggests that uh, number four and five, uh, the, the things that have never been done before by no one or by someone in some a context that is different from our, those are potentially the more complex. This is where unknowns can come, uncertainty, and when we explore and discover, we can have more unexpected surprises. It can also happen that that work is not feasible, is not possible, but is so innovative that if we manage to do that, we can have an incredible uh, return on investment. It's extremely valuable. So she says, start there, because uh, that's the important work. For number three, beware. You may, need, you may need to reach out to some expert. So be aware of that, plan for that. And for one and two, uh, well, that, those are things that has been done multiple times before. So maybe you can find a component or services, you can buy them. They may have been commoditized. So you can just buy them or reuse them. So this is a very quick and superficial description of this practice, just to give an idea of estimating the degree of complexity of the work. Then there are other practices very, very, very quickly, other practices that are built around this idea of co-creation. That is a fundamental uh, dynamic of complexity, human complexity, co-creation, co-evolution, and emergence or simplicity. Coevolution, if you like history, is like the story of the tools and human society. They co-evolved together. Or people and dogs, two species that have co-evolved together. Well, in uh, agile and product development, uh, the problem and the, the understanding of the problem and the finding of a solution, they also co-evolve gradually uh, together over time. So all the practices, uh, uh, there are a lot of practices that are based on, on uh, co-creation. And uh, uh, those practices uh, uh, look at the whole organization, goes beyond the team, but look at the department, multiple teams, department, or the whole organization. And what we discover when we look at those practical applications is that uh, yes, the organization have many systems that are potentially complex. Yes, this make a, a modern organization more susceptible to complex dynamic. But at the same time, those things make the organization better suited to cope and exploit uh, complexity. Those are just some visual of the many uh, practices uh, uh, based on uh, co-creation uh, that looks at the whole organization. Looking at these practices, one could potentially say, oh, but there are similar, pra similar agile practices that, uh, could that are also based on co-creation, co-evolution, and the simplicity or emergence. And this is true because those three pillars of complexity, of human complexity, are also three pillars of agile. So you may be uh, familiar with the, uh, 
design patterns and there are different type of design patterns in the same way when we look at application at the practical application of complexity theory there are the space where you can apply uh, com apply complexity theory in practical application uh, more or less uh, that landscape is organized in three parts uh, one is uh, we are complex we as individual and teams and this is where self-organization and practical application of self-organization may help the second part uh, is uh, around the idea that the work that we do may be complex and here we have practices that uh, enable us to estimate the degree of complexity, but also to adapt our approach in order to fit a specific degree of complexity. Think about the sensing complexity. And then there is another space, the, another space of application that is around the idea that the whole organization may be complex. So as a, a complexity practitioner, you can use this map in three ways. You can try to apply complexity theory in one of those three things and try to develop your own practical application. Or you can search practices in those spaces from other authors. Or you can look in the catalog of the book uh, and search for uh, new practices. These are a few of the concepts that are covered uh, around uh, self-organization and concepts that are useful for practical application. And uh, uh, before uh, closing uh, this presentation and moving to the question, this is the presentation of uh, the book that is uh, just uh, published in December, so it's uh, new. What come next? I'm going, uh, if someone has not already shared it, uh, a Slido link, so you can start to uh, post your questions and also vote question and we can have conversation. And also I've shared with you, Farah, if you want to share, uh, there is a special link with a discount for, uh, for everyone. Uh, good. Then I think uh, uh, we are ready to move to uh, question and answers. Do we have, uh, is anyone monitoring Slido now? Let me see if I can. Yeah, yeah we've got a few share, questions. So I can share the screen uh, if you want, uh, Luca, and we can look at these, these questions. We have uh, four, I think. Yeah, I give you a few minutes to breathe, to think about some question, if you want to post more questions on Slido and to vote the existing questions, the one that interests you more. So not only ask a new question, but also uh, vote the existing one. Let's take just a few minutes of time to do this. Okay, so I would like uh, to start inviting uh, uh, Roy. Uh, can someone unmute and bring in Roy so Roy can tell us about the, uh, the first uh, question? Okay, Lucas, so uh, thank you for excellent talk. Of course, <laughs> I knew it would be. Um, 
So my question is, when you, were, when you had that slide up with the control knobs, you said something like it's safer if the people in the system are involved in designing the way that the knobs get adjusted. Um, I don't know if, if I've got, quite got that right, but that's what I heard. Um, is there any evidence for that? Because I, I, lo I love that to be true. I firmly believe it to be true. And if, if there was evidence for it that I could spread the word, I would be delighted. So there are, there are two sides of it, uh, two sides. Uh, um, let's start uh, with the more theoretical one. And uh, it comes from uh, the concept that uh, complex systems are uh, unknowable. Every one of us uh, has a fragmented view of the system. The information is partial and the system as such is unknowable. So this comes from the theory of complex system. How you deal with that? When you deal with, the, with those systems, it becomes essential, essential to involve people. And this process, I, I call it co-creation. So that's one side of the answer. The second side of the answer is more specific to self-organization. Um, and is this idea that managers uh, are not uh, in an uh, objective external point of view of the system, but they are part of the system. And the system and the self-organization and the emergence is a dance where everyone participates. Yes, leaders and managers are in a position to uh, have local interactions that are more powerful in terms of uh, uh, being, a, uh, being an example and so on. But when they intervene to the system, they need, uh, uh, in order for the intervention to be more positive, they need to involve the other people in the decision. Otherwise, uh, uh, these other people will be moved around without understanding and will have a negative effect on those experimentation and intervention. So this is a suggestion on how to intervene in complex systems. What, what are your thoughts about this, Roy? I mean, it's so, it's so in my blood. I, I'm aware that I'm part of a system here, <laughs> and so I can't step outside of it to be objective about it. <laughs> so, yes. It seems like, of course, and I suppose my question in a way, to put it another way, is how can I convince people who believe in command and control, you know, believe that s systems are controllable, that in fact, they will get much better results if they involve people in the decision making? Any tips on convincing them? Well, uh, um, I, I can tell you uh, the approach uh, uh, that I try to suggest in, in the book and in the catalog. That is one of the idea of moving from theory to practice, right? We are talking about the theory that we know. How do we apply this in practice? So in, in the catalog and now in the book, there are different practices that have different, uh, the, some that are smaller and simple, and some that are gradually more advanced and require more, more time. So the idea is to start with the simple practices, to start to introduce the vocabulary and the basic concept, to involve people, including leaders, and start to see the dynamic, and build on that, and gradually moving on practices that are a little more advanced. Let me, again, let me make an example. I guess you heard about the uh, uh, Stacy diagram. Stacy, throw away that diagram. It's a diagram that describes the complexity uh, based on uh, two human experience, disagreement uh, and uh, um, certainty or uncertainty. Imagine a retrospective or you are looking at the project that is going on and maybe it's not uh, going on the way that you uh, think of and you started to notice that there is disagreement between people, a strong disagreement and or a strong uncertainty about what to do. It is still possible at this basic level to use that Stacy diagram in order to introduce the concept, for example, to a manager. And you start to introduce the idea or to the whole team actually in a retrospective if they are working as a team. And you say, look, that 
that conflict that you are seeing, that uncertainty, is not because some of you is right or some is wrong. It's not because you don't know what to do and you're not smart enough. I think it's because of the nature of the problem. Look, this diagram here suggests us that that can be the cause. So can we try to look closer at the problem, break it down, make it less complex? Or So this is an example an example of how to approach that. And doing this simple conversation, I start to introduce the concept of complexity. And the next time I can build on top of that and introduce something more advanced. And that's how, uh, yeah. Does it make sense or? Uh, For sure, yeah, absolutely. Move, progress with small steps based on what's already in place. and gradually build the understanding yeah through practice so like david marquette act your way into new thinking that's the philosophy cool thank you thank you very much roy i, I hope i answer somehow your your questions let's let's move to uh, to the next one uh, that is carlo question I think it is the next uh, more voted. Carlo Volpi, Carlo, do you want to jump in? Yep. Hi. Um, <clears throat> um, this is this is not about a specific practice, but uh, affects my, many practices. So w w when we have we want to run an experiment, uh, an issue I've seen a, a lot is um, an expectation of uh, um, having a response uh, within a certain time, or having a let's call it a stable response. A certain, within a certain time and there is a lot of impatience in that so you you end up having that um you know i don't know the long shower hose problem where you you turn a knob for having a warmer water it's not coming it's not coming you turn it you turn it you turn it you turn it and then and then you boil yourself off uh, or in some systems you have an initial response which is the opposite of what this long-term response um is in, in anywhere in your knowledge is there a place where someone has looked at, you know, what are the characteristics of a system that tells you how much you have to actually wait to say, and say, yeah, this is the, this is a good reading on the system. This is how it's disposed to, 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 to respond or this kind of stuff. So uh, th this is a very good question. And I don't know if there is something about the name Carlo, but Carlo basically the other time asked exactly the same question. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Two, two things that come in, in uh, my mind. Uh, one thing sometimes uh, uh, is uh, what you are doing that uh, define uh, the when. For example, imagine that uh, uh, you have something, uh, a fixed event, could be Black Friday, uh, could be the Formula One race if you are writing, uh, working on a software for a race or any event. And you're trying to solve some problem where, well, that deadline will become the moment where you take a check about what's going on. That become a checkpoint. So is an external imposed checkpoint. And in that case, you may repeat that uh, checkpoint multiple times later on. And um, It, it, when you work in team, it happens often that you have those checkpoints. So you, you, for example, the retrospective meetings, and you repeat those uh, checks. Another approach comes from the suggestion to, from Joseph Perlin, uh, thinking about a system like steering uh, a very huge ship or uh, uh, changing the temperature the reaction is usually, usually extremely delayed. So many systems have uh, this typical uh, uh, behavior that uh, when you do an action, the, the reaction, the consequences become uh, visible uh, late. In, in, because of that, uh, Joseph Perlin suggests to change one thing at the time and wait enough time. So be slow, be patient to give time to the Uh, to the things to come out, become visible, and stabilize. stabilize. Basically, wait. Change one thing of the time and wait. And those are the two suggestions uh, that I've heard so far. The third comes from experience. 
So when you do similar things, you remember uh, how much time before it took for a consequence to uh, become evident. And uh, so, a new system basically running an experiment to run experiments. Sorry, so in a new system, you would run an experiment to know how to run the experiments <laughs> or how to read the result of experiments. <laughs> You will learn you will learn why why you do it yeah 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 true uh, cool. someone else uh, voted this question i don't know if the answer uh, if uh, there is uh, someone else that was interested in this question and want to add or if someone has an opinion on this and want to contribute Seems no one want to say anything more about this. Let's move to the next one. Roy, I put you on hold. Let's go with the team. Since uh, I answered your first question before, let's go with to team. Team, are you there? Thank you very much. Yeah, I am indeed. Hopefully you can hear me. Yes. Good evening. Yeah, so a very interesting talk. And I actually work um, with software, agile software development teams as a product manager. And they obviously have to estimate tasks of different types, even though they're doing agile, because we need to try and get some sort of backlog in shape. And, and when you think about the complexity concept that you introduced, is there any sort of formal way you could sort of quantify the use of the, the complexity scales, either within the team, the simple one shown, or between teams or between the bits of software to actually to adjust those estimations. Are there any sort of theories around that? Well, th there are. Tell me more. Why do you want to adjust? What will be the consequences? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand better your thinking. What so, would so the, the idea is to get to get to get better estimates. So rather than saying, well, it could be six to, to 20 weeks. You know, we know this is complex, therefore it's going to be much more at the upper end. So it's going to be three or four sprints rather than one or two. So just, just get some feel of complexity leading to more accurate estimates of effort. Uh, in part, the answer is yes. All the practices in part two uh, may interest you a lot, but let me be specific. Uh, um, there are few techniques uh, uh, for example, I mentioned the practice from Leeds Calc before uh, yeah. that uh, ask you those questions uh, and based on that, they try to guess the level of complexity. So four and yeah. five are extremely complex. Uh, the one, uh, number three, uh, you have to read the skate to, to see where it goes are not very complex. You just have to reach out. What this give you in terms of estimation? Well, it's going to tell you that number four and number five, you cannot estimate. Those are like extreme experiment. You need to do probes before. You just have to try to identify the problem, to build certainty, and then you can estimate. You cannot go to a client and promise uh, length you in agile term or, or in extreme programming term those are candidates for spikes so that's one practice then in the in the catalog you find another practice uh, uh, that uh, um, is uh, on the same type of thinking uh, so estimating complexity uh, using uh, the cone of uncertainty, uh, not really the cone of uncertainty, but is an application of that concept. And the idea is this, is similar to, to what Liz suggests, but this practice look at three different sources of complexity. It looks at the domain and it tell you which characteristics of the domain can make it more or less complex. It looks at the technology and the systems that are involved in the implementation. And then it looks at the people involved and the dynamic. 
and uh, uh, suggest a different degree of complexity. Based on different degree of complexity, uh, this practice tell you then tell you that the order of magnitude of the estimation error can be uh, five percent or less, can be uh, much bigger, or to the point that uh, you don't even know how big is the estimation error because it's it's too good. And so, in terms of investment uh, and in terms of uh, uh, strategy to implement those things, you, you need to do different things. The simple one, you can commit. The one that are less complex, you can commit with the estimate that you have, and you can use buffers uh, eventually, a small buffer to make sure that if something goes wrong, you don't, uh, you still manage. For those in the middle, you know that in an agile way, you have to iterate. You know that the error can be as big as 20% or more, but as soon as you start to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the third one instead is telling you, look, this is big, like Litz was suggesting, you cannot commit here. So you can tell to your investors or to your client, let's do an, ex if you think that there is a big return on investment, let's do some experiment, some spike, and then let's see later. Sorry if I went alone, but I want to give you some practical, uh, does this help or, or not? Or are you looking for something different? No, it's a superb answer. Very, very clear. And I, I, I hope I can get to come to your next talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Timmy. I think now we can go to Roy uh, again, Roy. <laughs> and uh, I encourage everyone else. So it's me, I'm talking, but everyone can intervene. If you have an opinion of what is said, or if you want to add something on that topic of the question, please, it's uh, open mic, uh, uh, jump in. Starting from Roy. No, sorry, I saw I say something about the previous question then. Sorry. Um, I'm just saying that as it is true for risk, also for complexities, in my experience, it's really useful to start, um, um, you know, gathering uh, historical information as soon as you can. So trying to estimate complexity as soon as you can, so you know what the effect of a complexity is in your context for estimation or other things. So the sooner you start estimating it, the more knowledge you get later when you, you know, when you are estimating complexity about the effect it has on your, on your work. Yeah, yeah I, I like that, Carlo. Indeed, uh, um, that complexity estimation is something that can be repeated at, uh, for example, the planning meeting or can be reviewed at uh, um, retrospective. Uh, on top of that, Carlo, you, you created a beautiful map of the, of, of the practices in the book. Uh, uh, feel free to share the link on, uh, on the chat with everyone else uh, of the beautiful map that you created, Carlo. It was you, right? Roy, Roy, are you still there? I'm still here, yeah, yeah. Well, Should I... I Go for my question? Yes. Please. Okay, so just very simply, when you said there were two definitions of self-organization, one from the perspective of complexity theory, one from the perspective of the Agile Manifesto, I didn't quite understood the difference, understand the difference. I, I understood the complexity theory definition applies in the Agile context, but that there was some difference the other, other way, and I didn't quite get that. Oh, it, it was a teaser, I didn't answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, but uh, I can answer now. Anyone want to add on this question? Anyone want to jump in or think to know the answer? D don't be shy. I'm a little tired of listening to my voice. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll answer this question. Um, have you, have you noticed some changes in that area from the new Scrum Guide, the updated Scrum Guide? guide. So the, the updated Scrum Guide, has someone noticed that? Is anyone helping me here? It's uh, self-management now, isn't it? Ah, there you go. Thank you, Carlo. So what, do you know why it has changed, Carlo? Oh, come on, don't put me on the spot. No, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yes, because it, they wanted to convey the meaning of it, uh, being more um, uh, the team uh, basically taking more ownership of their destiny and evolution as well. I can't remember exactly what, there they, they were two different directions they wanted to go to, and I can't remember which word it was, sorry. Think about that, uh, if it comes to your mind, tell me. Uh, one was the team, so Agile used the term self-organization with the meaning that the team have the authority to self-direct the work. They have a decision that has been more decision power delegated to them, that the hierarchy is, uh, uh, is more flat, and that the manager do not uh, uh, micromanage people. So that's how Agile interpret self-organization. Usually is intended that uh, is uh, you people say self-management or self-direction to intend that. But in order to have that, uh, first of all, uh, the, the organization needs to allow people to, to have that uh, social, uh, uh, social dynamic of relating to each other reflected in the work. Without that, you cannot have the self-management. And for this reason, all the theory and the learning that come from uh, uh, complexity theory self-organization applies also to die. But isn't there also some kind of restriction in the sense that a truly self-organizing system, a true, a completely self-organizing team would decide whether to have a scrum master, whether to have a product owner, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so uh, to, to use the, the, the new terminology, you can say that of a true self-managing team. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Self-organizing is simply that they socially, they relate to each other and the organization let those relations emerge. Yeah. Instead of uh, breaking really down. Yeah. But yes, uh, then they, they even decide if they want to do Scrum or not. Yeah. And that was one of the original idea of Agile. Go that's back. actually connected with the other change. Sorry, the, the, the fact that actually the, the concept of team, it really includes everyone now. So it's, um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion, is the product owner or not, is uh, part of the team, or is the Scrum Master part or not of the team, you know, you know, it's more, yeah. Yeah, because the self-organizing system includes not only the people, but those around them, the system is open. Okay. I mean, speak by Anne's comment in the chat. <laughs> Sorry? I'm intrigued by Anne's comment in the chat. I'd love to hear more. Oh, so, so in Dave Snowden's um, Kenevan world, um, the complex domain, and so Kenevan is a framework in the complex domain. So the Kenevan framework, the domains are defined by the constraints and the important constraint for a complex system is that it is an enabling constraint. So that's one way to think of your, your teams because they do have to interact with other people as well. <laughs> so an, an example of, enable, of an enabling constraint might be, you know, we're all going to do Scrum and you self-organize from there. So you see that in complex adaptive systems in nature as well. They have enabling constraints. Thank you, Anne. was interesting. Anyone else, please intervene. Uh, don't be shy. That was a useful and interesting. Thank you all. And thank you, Carlo. Thank you, Roy, for speaking up. Uh, William? Bring on, sorry to jump in there. Anne's point kind of took a couple of minutes to sink in. We, we talk about, I wonder if Scrum is an example of an enabling constraint, because usually we describe an enabling constraint as a starting principle that flexes over time as kind of requirements and needs emerge. But Scrum is quite rigid, isn't it? So if you uh, apply it as per the guide, you know, they're very clear, the authors of the guide to say, you must do what it, says, it states in the guide. If you don't doing that, you're not doing Scrum. So I'm wondering whether, and I'm just thinking out loud, really, I don't have a definitive answer, but I'm wondering if Scrum is an enabling constraint with that definition. Anyone has an opinion? Tell me if I'm speaking too much, Luca. Um, so si Simon, that the, 
I'm wondering if an enabling constraint is necessarily something that that changes and is, is flexible. My and please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of an example of an enabling constraint would be my skeleton, your skeleton. Um, and so it enables me to reach up to, to, to something which wouldn't be possible if I didn't have a skeleton because I'd just be a blob of jelly on the floor. So in that sense, its rigidity is what makes it enabling. And I mean, although it's sort of it's changed a bit over time, I try to avoid it changing too much. <laughs> So uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm also just thinking off the top of my head here. I'm curious well, about where that, that, yeah. that, that definition of it being flexible comes from, Simon. I'm thinking also about if somebody asked you to write some music, write me a song, uh, that's quite difficult. Whereas if somebody said, um, write me um, a song in the style of, uh, it's gonna be a regular pop song, with an A A B A B structure, the B is going to be a chorus, and you're going to have um, an eight-bar, uh, you know, uh, intro at the beginning with some, you know, <laughs> you'd have a lot more to go on. You could even say it's going to be a four-chord song. You're going to use, you know, uh, the, these four chords, and you you go out there um, uh, on the internet, you can find many, many thousands of such songs, which are very, very different. Um, and yet they are all living within this constraint. Um, have a look at Axes of Awesome four chord song if you're interested. Yeah, and the Ramones entire back catalogue, right? As like four chords. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm trying to apply it, just thinking it through in my head. Again, you know, enabling versus, what was the other one? Constraining? No, that's, that's the same word. Enforcing process, is that right? Is kind of the opposite. So an enabling constraint is a starting principle, like we say, and it enables something to flex and grow. So I wonder whether something like, you know, the Agile Manifesto would be an example of an enabling constraint. So we're saying you need to engage with your customer regularly, keep your customer close, deliver regularly, working software is your kind of definitive uh, ultimate version of the truth, the undeniable truth of working software. This might be enabling constraint because it doesn't tell you how to do something. It says these principles start with these and whatever emerges from that is your agile influenced process. Yeah. Whereas Scrum says, do these things. And there isn't a lot of flex, is there? It says, oh, I suppose there is. I suppose, you know, they don't say you must run two week sprints. I think the question that I would ask is to say, if you said team do Scrum and you went and did that on 10 teams, would they all come up with the same thing? And if they're coming up with different answers, I think that suggests going back to what Farah said, that example of the music is a really, really good example because you have the constraint, but you can't predict what the outcome is. Mm. If, if you're sprints at... themselves are enabling constraints as well for teams within Scrum. So they enable the team to learn how to deliver a piece of software in two weeks, essentially, or in whatever length that is. And if they don't learn it, you know, they, they, they sort of iterate on it and keep trying to do it. And eventually they will learn it, but it's the two, two, two week door, the whatever week time box you've got that is the constraint there. Um, and if they have actions forced upon them or like, um, you know, stories forced upon them into that sprint so that it blows, they're not going to learn it. It no longer becomes an enabling constraint. It's a bit weird. Uh, two things came, uh, came to my mind about the, um, the original question. A uh, great example about uh, enabling constraint, uh, and uh, you already said everything. Uh, the example of uh, uh, the rigid constraint, like the music, uh, or the example of saying, uh, uh, I, try to in I try to tell you as a constraint, uh, do scrum, let's see what come up. That is about uh, uh, creativity. There is something that I set a rigid constraint and I see what come out of that. And that could uh, enable creativity, but that doesn't have, that's not about complex system. The idea that we had in the agile community for a while of following a, a limited number of rules like Kanban just have three or six rule, uh, Scrum seven, but you follow rigidly the rule uh, is not uh, based on complexity theory. If you look at the abide model from Dave Snowden, there are barriers. Barriers is a concept that can be used to introduce some constraint. 
and those barriers explicitly are permeable or elastic. The idea of a rigid barrier does not come from complexity. For a while, uh, people used the, the Boyd, uh, I don't know if you knew, know the Boyd simulation or the cellular automata simulation that are based on few rigid rules. For a while, people use that theory to justify the concept that people have to follow Scrum by the book or follow Kanban by the book, but that's not based on complexity. All right, that was an excellent discussion. We have about five minutes left, so we might have to finish there. I'll tell you what, Luca, if you have time, we have quite a few other questions on the Sligo. So if you have time, uh, we could ask you to go through that. And if you wanted to provide maybe some written responses, if you have time, we can publish that on our Slack channel and maybe the people that ask them um, can actually. That's fine. So you suggest we can do this later on the Slack channel, right? Yeah. I think so. If you're if you're open to that, we can talk about that a bit later. If you have, if you have. Uh, ju just to close, uh, uh, we have already shared with you the uh, the link with the coupon and a couple of Twitter uh, tweet and uh, LinkedIn about the book. Every like and reshare if you like the book and the topics is appreciated. Thank you very much, and I pass back to you. Marvellous. Thank you very much. Wow. That was some food for thought, I think, to put it mildly. Fantastic presentation. Thank you, uh, Luca. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. So coming up, as we said earlier, we have uh, Patricia Gestoso talking about embedding ethics and inclusion in workplaces. That's at the end of February. And in fact, the, the, uh, the advert, or if you like, the uh, meetup is live on Eventbrite now. So you can register for a ticket right now if you want. That's 25th of February, 7 to 8.30. It's yeah, she... in the chat. Thank you. And, uh, nice. Links in the chat. Thank you, Farah. And that's it. So many thanks to Luca again for speaking. Really fascinating. Yeah, very applicable to, to others. I absolutely love when I, you know, someone takes the theory of complexity, which is fascinating, and then creates the practical applications. Um, it's, it's absolutely marvellous. So thanks to Luca for speaking. Uh, thanks to all our participants for their input and for their great questions and involvement. And don't forget the Slack channel if you're interested. Don't forget the Twitter handle. And all the best. Stay safe. And we'll see you soon. Thank you very much.